Hello and welcome to the TMDSAS podcast, where we'll explore the TMDSAS application in greater detail by connecting you, the applicant, with the admissions experts who are ready to help. I'm your host, Enrique Hasso, Coordinator of Research, Advising Services, and Digital Media at the Texas Health Education Service in the TMDSAS office in Austin, Texas. We're joined today by Mr. Filo Maldonado of the Texas A&M College of Medicine. He is the Associate Dean of Admissions and is also a Joint Assistant Professor in the Department of Humanities and Medicine. Mr. Maldonado, thank you very much for joining us. It's my pleasure. Very glad to have you. So we're going to go ahead and dig into some questions that we've been asking several other uh, admissions professionals throughout the state. Okay. Uh, First off, can you tell us a little bit about your academic background? Okay. Um, My undergraduate uh, training is uh, in the liberal arts and humanities, hence the title, I suppose. (laughs) Uh, Most of it is in English and history. Great. So uh, initially, my uh, career goals were perhaps uh, were to pursue... um, uh, teaching, and then from that, uh, perhaps uh, move on to graduate studies mm. to help teachers become better teachers and, and, and teach at that level. Um, so, uh, and that training took place at St. Mary's University, mm-hmm. and then uh, subsequently went on to get a master's degree at the University of Texas uh, at San Antonio, because that was that's my hometown. Yep. And um, and the master's concentration was in higher education administration. And then uh, when I moved to uh, Bryan College Station uh, 29 years ago, back in 1988, then I pursued the doctoral degree in um, educational curriculum and instruction. Mm-hmm. My goal at the time uh, was, like I said before, you know, to uh, eventually move into higher education, uh, do research in um, um Learning theory and um, and curriculum and instructional methods to help teachers, uh, particularly uh, teachers who um, who had an interest in working with kids uh, from underrepresented groups and um, and disadvantaged circumstances. And the reason for that is because that's where I came from, right? And and um, uh, and if it wasn't for uh, teachers who kind of took me under their wing and provided that kind of mentorship probably wouldn't be where I am today. Mm-hmm. So, but that was the goal. And, but how I got there is kind of circuitous in a way because uh, I had a mentor mm-hmm. and um, he uh, told me about an opportunity at Texas A&M's College of Medicine at the time through a grant, uh, an HCOP grant. Uh, we were, I was helping uh, Dr. Mike Medina, who became my mentor and also a former student of St. Mary's University. Um, and that's how I kind of ended up in Bryan College Station in the position um, that I am now, where it evolved to the position that I am in now. But without going into more detail about my educational background, that's where I am. Uh, so I was kind of unique in a way at mm-hmm. the time because here you had this liberal arts guy right. <laughs> among all these physicians and um, PhDs, particularly in the medical sciences. Mm-hmm. And yet uh, I was able to adapt, which was an interesting uh, development over time. Yes, yeah, so you definitely bring a fresh perspective having that background. It's a little different, uh, yes, because uh, my my training is working with young people on a very personal level, you know, to help them acclimate to uh, an intense uh, or maybe even rigorous, you know, under, undergraduate experience, especially if they're coming from you know uh, circumstances that perhaps didn't afford those kind of opportunities. So there were. The, the, you know, the, many of the uh, young people that I work with were uh, at least labeled at the time as at risk. And our goal was to help them acclimate to a higher education environment and assure their success so that they can go on either to graduate studies or professional school or, you know, into the world of work with a, with a degree. Great. Thank you very much for sharing that. Sure. It's a little uh, different than the yeah, typical. Just possibly. a little bit. <laughs> and that's great because that, that really shows, you know, the amount of diversity that there is just education-wise right, uh, right. In, in positions like yours. Uh, so leading us to, into our next question, um, what kind of what work experience do you have in admissions or student affairs sure. um, over, over the time that you've been right. uh, both at Texas A&M uh, College of Medicine uh, and, and throughout your career. Sure. Well, they really started there at St. Mary's working with Dr. Medina because mm-hmm. he was 
one of the first in the state of Texas, and not the first in the state of Texas, to actually secure an HCOP grant, which translates to Health Careers Opportunities Program, which was funded through the uh, Department of Disadvantaged Assistance through HRSA. Mm -hmm. uh, so there were many of these across the country, but very few in the state of Texas, and so he was the first. So he created a pipeline with St. Mary's University to the UT Health Science Center at San Antonio. Right. So they, again, the target uh, population were underrepresented students yes. that potentially could pursue uh, careers in the health profession, but particularly medicine. Mm -hmm. Since I, I was already at St. Mary's and running a writing center and a learning center and working with kids that we, I had a Title III grant, by the way, that I was working with to help some of these disadvantaged kids from the poorest school district in San Antonio to help them acclimate to St. Mary's. And, um, uh, so I had some programmatic experience and administrative experience working with our faculty at St. Mary's and with the administration. He said, so when he came over to talk to our dean of uh, arts and sciences, is there somebody that can help me? So that's how it all got started. And then that evolved to my transitioning to Texas A&M at the College of Medicine to exactly what I was doing at St. Mary's is run the HCOP program, which essentially provided uh, resources and summer internship experiences for kids from disadvantaged backgrounds and underrepresented groups. So that was initially what I started to do. Right. And that was, I was hired to kind of diversify the student body mm -hmm. a little bit, bring a representation at the time was dismal, uh, of students of, of color. And, um, so the HCOP grant was kind of what brought it, uh, initiated that process and a closer look at students from that perspective. And then subsequently that evolved into an Hispanic Center of Excellence. So A&M, mm -hmm. interestingly, was the first school in the state to have an Hispanic Center of Excellence back in 1989, 90. And then Galveston came on board mm -hmm. and, and, and some of the other schools. Uh, and we, we held that uh, designation for about two years. And then the grant you know, funding ran out. But uh, uh, I, I kind of uh, was in charge of all that and... Mm -hmm. uh, and um, was fortunate enough to secure those grants. So that's how I got into it. And then uh, within the Office of Student Affairs, because that's who hired me, I uh, was recruiting for the medical school, working with kids of color and, and, and disadvantaged kids to afford them opportunities uh, in, into medical school. And then eventually that evolved into an admission, more of an admissions role, working more closely with the admissions committee, and then I became a guest faculty interviewer. Mm -hmm. And then um, uh, the dean of student affairs at the time who became my mentor in admissions was Mr. Uh, Mr. Billy Rankin, who came from Baylor, mm -hmm. um, became our dean for student affairs, then put me in the position of director of admissions in 1990 and 91. And then from that point on, I learned everything essentially about the admissions process to medical school from him. Mm -hmm with many, many, he's had many, many years of experience and was already near retiring at the time. So he was a wealth of information. And then from there, you know, it just developed. Right. Sorry to make it, I hope I'm not being too... Oh, no, not at all. Uh, no, this is, this is really great Too prolific. This is really great information. Kind of, it, you know, everybody's journey is different. Right. But we all kind of end up in, in, in a certain position. Right. And I think it's re extremely beneficial for a lot of applicants, you know, especially... You know, when we're talking about non-traditional applicants who it took right. the scenic route to, to that's medical right. school. That's right. So it allowed for a little, uh, you know, uh, I think it heightened my sensitivity even more. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it was a challenge, you know, because uh, working with faculty that were pretty entrenched and really didn't understand it, in the, the admissions process. They right. really didn't understand it. Uh, and for me, kind of a, at the time, a young guy, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, to try to convince these people who have been in medicine for all these years and pretty entrenched in their methods was quite a bit of a challenge. Okay. Um, but uh, I earned their respect and hopefully, uh, and, and luckily they had a listening ear and mm -hmm. we made some changes, which brings us to today in a sense, you know. The power of hard work. Yes. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, um, thank you very much for, for sharing your background. Sure. Um, I, I think a lot of applicants, you know, are, can sometimes be a little bit confused about what differentiates the schools mm -hmm. uh, and, right. you know, what a certain medical school offers versus what a, a different medical school offers and how they can be similar. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us some of the things that make um, Texas A&M uh, College of Medicine unique? Sure. 
when, when I arrived there, uh, I learned something that uh, about the school. Uh, at the time, it was a very small school. It was only enrolling 48 students. So we were kind of like a, you know, a, a, a small speck on the map in a sense compared mm-hmm. to all of the other schools that obviously had more of a reputation and a history. So that was another challenge for the mm-hmm. school is to um, uh, you know, in, in, enhance its image and, and, and become a real player in that regard. So, But one of the things that really, I think, set the institution apart and, and has been essentially the foundation um, are really three uh, uh, important virtues uh, that it was founded on. And the first one was um, that the faculty and the students that are involved uh, in training and, and that are, of course, uh, the recipients of that training are, are guided by this principle of responsibility. Uh, understanding the importance of the responsibility that they're taking on in terms of caring for patients and to the profession as a whole. Mm-hmm. And then the second virtue is compassion. And I think that's one of the uh, aspects, I think, of our institution. Not that others aren't doing this, but uh, the curriculum and and the climate or the culture was essentially to uh, de- uh, help develop or generate uh, a... Um, a, a physician that at the center of their practice was compassion and care. And, um, and then lastly, service. So those three virtues, responsibility, compassion, and service. And, and I was really struck by that. And when I met the founding dean of our medical school, who is also, uh, before he became a physician, was actually a minister mm-hmm. and was, uh, has an interesting background because uh, during the Second World War in the Pacific, uh, he was in Nagasaki when, you know, um, after the, um, the aftermath of the, um, of the atomic bomb. And for him, that was the turning point, you mm-hmm. know, where he went from a, a minister to uh, perhaps pursuing medicine as a career, given the affliction, you know, that he, he witnessed. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he became our founding dean, uh, Dr. Uh, James Knight, and he essentially uh, founded the school or, uh, on these three principles. And, um, and he wanted to develop a, a new generation of physicians that were patient-centered mm-hmm. um, and began uh, and, and a, a patient or a physician or an institution that would uh, make at, uh, it, at it, as its mission uh, the underserved and the those that were the untouchables at the time, many of those communities that are isolated and rural. So that was essentially what the school was founded on. So I was really struck by that. Yeah. And since then, uh, that's been the foundation. And that's what I've been doing for all these years is telling uh, students that story. So when they come to our medical school, in essence, we're looking for students to live up to the or that have exercised those virtues and can live up to those virtues. And then since then, of course, a set of very important values mm-hmm. um, have uh, evolved and emerged uh, that are at the center, you know, of our institution. So one of the distinguishing factors about our student body, for example, is that they're very um, service-centered and oriented. So that's one of the areas that we as an admissions committee, you know, mm-hmm. hone in on as part of our evaluation process where some students may dismiss that as perhaps not as important or something just to do uh, because it has to be done or it's a second thought because most of them tend to concentrate on healthcare related experience or research and not give a lot of thought to that aspect, right. which we think aligns very well with this virtue of compassion and caring. And one of the, and, and obviously with the one of the core principles or competencies that the WMC you know, in recent years mm-hmm. has espoused, which is service orientation. Right. right. So that uh, that I think is a distinguishing aspect of our school. Uh, the mm-hmm. other thing uh, I think that's re- that I've noticed, and and even to this day, from a small school to a now a large school with many campuses and a student body of 180 to 200 students per year. Uh, that those principles are, are still being espoused mm-hmm. and that um, the experience between our faculty and students is very personalized. You know, in yes. other words, that students have access, our faculty care about our students. Um, 
what's evolved over time is this kind of a collegial relationship, which is interesting because, you know, usually students are looked down as at the very bottom of the, um, of the ladder and that they have to climb up this hierarchical ladder. And instead, you know, uh, we embrace them mm-hmm. as, uh, as members of a learning community where there's, you know, uh, sharing and, um, in that collegial relationship. So I, I think that's an aspect uh, or aspects of our school that I think would um, interest you know, mm-hmm. students uh, out there and uh, and would attract students to our school because of that kind of culture and environment. Absolutely. And that's very, very interesting how it comes from the very establishment of the school and, you know, now... Several several decades later, yeah, it's, it's we're still approaching our fortieth uh, anniversary. That's fantastic. Which, you know, we're still a young school in many mm-hmm. ways compared to many of the others, but uh, again, forty years of I think has um, taught us a lot. Mm-hmm. You know about how to train students and, and how to adapt. You know to the changing healthcare environment. Absolutely, a lot of applicants, you know, have to make several choices. You know whether mm-hmm. they they move to uh, the urban center of the heart of the medical center in Houston or in San Antonio or mm-hmm. um, more rural locations like Lubbock. Mm-hmm. Uh, what drew you to the Brian Clutch Station area? And more importantly, what drew you to want to move from San Antonio to Brian Clutch Station? Well, to answer the latter question about you know, what compelled me maybe to move to Brian Clutch Station was to get a doctorate, you know, to work on a doctorate degree. And then, of course, uh, the encouragement of my mentor at the time, Dr. Medina. I mean, I was either going to stay at St. Mary's and commute to Austin to mm-hmm. get the doctorate or uh, or maybe look at making a career move, go to a College Station, earn the doctorate there, and at the same time maybe uh, begin to develop a career. I, at the time, I didn't know it was going to evolve to a career. Right. I, I, I was going to be <laughs> back in San Antonio in the next three to four years, but mm-hmm. it didn't work out that way because yeah. apparently they liked what I was doing. Uh, they wanted me, a, me to be a part of the team, and so I, I hung around. But it was it was it was not an easy transition coming mm-hmm. from San Antonio. At the time, almost thirty years ago, is a different community mm-hmm. than it is today. Today, I think the Brian Call Station and the university are. Is, is more diverse uh, and um, and a real center of learning, uh, more international uh, than than it ever than, uh, than it was when I arrived there. You know, uh, there's probably an image of the university, but once I got there and I, I kind of understood some of the culture at the university, I became enamored with it uh, because some of those you know um, principles or virtues that it you know that it um, uh, upholds, um, are, I think, are important, mm-hmm. and uh, and principles that many you know people would probably uh, espouse and, and exercise. Um, but so, oh, oh, um, but I was at a medical school, which is kind of a, a different environment and, um, and somewhat apart from the university culture. Mm-hmm. Yes. But yet, still, you know, uh, and so we had our own culture, but still. Uh, in many ways, uh, the, the college still espoused those very important principles. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that that's what kind of uh, drew me there first, get an education uh, and continue to move forward uh, in, in, in my evolution in terms of a, of a career and, and, and then hopefully return you know, to San Antonio. But uh, that didn't work out. Now, the first question was, what I can't remember yeah. drew you to the Bryan College Station area, and what's kept you there? Well, uh, well, that kind of drew me there, and then what kept me there was the fact that the the college, in particular, um, institutionalized my position mm-hmm. because initially the position that I assumed when I was there was on soft money, so I took a bit big risk mm-hmm. uprooting my family. At the time, I had a three month baby, three month old baby. And then my wife, and then we gave up our home and we put it on the market and it didn't sell. And then we were living, you know, and renting and I was making a bare bones salary at the time. So it was a real transition and mm-hmm. it was really difficult. But what kept us there, uh, obviously was, uh, the, uh, the opportunity that the institution gave me to stay on, uh, permanently as opposed to letting the grant run out and then to, you know, 
and telling me, see ya, thank you for your work. <laughs> um, so, um, and then um, I had to, since I was there full time and I couldn't really work on the doctorate on a full time basis, mm -hmm. I basically had to do it on a part time basis. So to be able to accomplish that in three to four years was almost impossible. Yeah. So that kept me there a little longer. And then, uh, and then from a coordinator, then I went to director, and then I was, and then I, I saw several deans come into, into our medical school, mm -hmm. uh, and then they promoted me to assistant dean, and then, uh, associate dean about, uh, I guess now 10 years ago. It must have been about that long ago. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> So you have, a, you have a very personal connection that you've built over over time. Well, you know, I was surprised because uh, here I didn't have the doctorate, so mm -hmm. I didn't have a terminal degree, and even though I was working on it, and yet they were willing to, it, you know, uh, I suppose, uh, trust me and mm -hmm. confided in me with the kind of work that they wanted me to to do, and um, I. I I was humbled by that, and 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 at the same time, uh, you know, uh, I it I felt good uh, about the fact that they trusted me to that extent, and right. that they felt my work was of the quality that they were seeking. So, but uh, it didn't come without a lot of hard work. I mean, and sacrifice. In fact, uh, even to the point where I you know wasn't seeing my family very you know, as often as I should because I was traveling quite a bit. Because I was kind of a one-man office in a way. I had a secretary, and that was about it, and that was the Office of Admissions uh, many, many years ago. Um, and eventually that e e evolved, but uh, not without, you know, some work and mm -hmm. some hardships along the way. But it's uh, like any career, it's a, it's a learning experience, and you have your ups and downs, and you learn from those, you know, experiences to be better at what you do. Uh, and eventually to build that trust and that confidence. So in working with students uh, and, and applicants who are interested in, the, in coming to Texas A&M College of Medicine, what aspects of, of the community and of, of the, the institution do you think really draw them to that area? Well, you know, uh, what students may not know this uh, out there, uh, that some, perhaps depending on how, uh, you know, how... Um, active they are on the internet, you know, and do and explore the various institutions. But our, we're a multi-campus, you mm -hmm. know, medical school with that. Bryan College Station is only really one stop in a way. A student at really does have a choice to some degree of, of, of completing their entire medical education experience if they want, but um, at least those four years. But in addition to the Bryan College Station campus, students also train in Houston, in Dallas, in Austin, Round Rock, and Temple, Texas. Originally, uh, there were, we were kind of a two-campus model where students started in Bryan College Station for their preclinical years and then transitioned to Temple with uh, Scott & White, which mm -hmm. was our first uh, principal clinical affiliate and partner in training students. And, f and over time, over these 20-plus or more years, it's evolved to a multi-campus institution with uh, clinical affiliates in Houston and partnerships with Methodists and Kelsey Seaboat and St. Luke's and St. Joseph's at the Texas Medical Center, Baylor University Medical Center in Dallas, Timberland Mental Health, Cook's Children's, among other, you know, uh, clinical partners and small group practice in the Dallas Fort Worth area. Mm -hmm. And then in, in, uh, in Temple, of course, uh, now, uh, Baylor Scott and White Central, which is merged with the Baylor Health System. Um, and um, Central Texas Veterans Healthcare System. And then in Round Rock, uh, we were able, uh, through some legislative funding of about $50 million and with a match funding through the um, uh, Round Rock community in Williamson County, we were able to start a campus in Round Rock mm -hmm. uh, and train students there. Uh, and some of our clinical partners have been hospitals and group practices when the Seton system and the St. David system. And so some of our students are commuting between those two communities to get their training. So those are essentially our, our facilities, but students actually converge in the Bryan College Station area for their preclinical training. And we've made 
um, like most medical schools, you know, they, they're constantly looking at the curriculum to make it more efficient yes. and more effective and, and to kind of, um, uh, uh, evolve, you know, with, uh, with the, uh, changes, uh, in, in, uh, in instructional methods and so on. So we, uh, uh our, our curriculum is, uh, organ systems based, which is not unusual today. It's integrated. Uh, there's more clinical science and more clinical medicine integrated into the preclinical years. We shorten the uh, traditional two years or 24 months to 18 months, uh, expanding the clinical opportunities for students. Um, and um, so those those are significant developments. Mm-hmm. Uh, there There is a trend nationwide. Uh, schools looking at the curriculums that way and uh, what compels many of the schools to do this essentially is the LCME, the accrediting body for medical education, because it's time now for schools to move into the 21st century, mm-hmm. given all of the issues in healthcare and, and so on. But, um, so I'm glad that the school's moving forward. There's still a lot of work to be done and many students will find that medical schools are constantly refining and sophisticated, making right. the curriculum more sophisticated. So it's not stagnant by any means. Mm-hmm. So we're among the, you know, all of our you know sister institutions in giving our students the best educational experience possible. So we have well-trained faculty, and um, and being on the campus of a, of a major university like Texas A&M mm-hmm. really uh, affords the students many of the opportunities and resources that are available in an institution of that magnitude, which is nice yeah. to be on that kind of a campus. And then, of course, uh, something that we emphasize in our curriculum, like others do, is scholarly work and research. And, and that's just not limited to the medical school or many of the other health professions that are part of our health science center, but even across the university and many of the other colleges within the university, which then can help students become better, more well-rounded mm-hmm. uh, and uh, um, develop a better understanding of the human condition and, and look at uh, medicine from another, from different lenses instead of right. just, you know, the traditional one. That's very exciting for, for a lot of students because you know, not only do you have geographical, uh, flexibility, mm-hmm. but you also have you know, the flexibility across the various disciplines. Right. Exactly. In fact, to, uh, often to the extent of giving students, uh, opportunities to, uh, combine their MD with another degree. You know, the traditional MD, PhD, of course, like all medical schools. Those schools have, but uh, uh, and we're seeing more medical schools doing this as affording students the opportunity to combine a degree with a master's, for example. So we have a program called MD Plus mm-hmm. that allows the students to combine their MD with an MPH or an MS in medical sciences or with a uh, a business in a, uh, an MBA, a master's in business administration. And now uh, it's evolved now to offering engineering students the opportunity to earn a master's in engineering uh, in conjunction with their uh, MD. Um, that's now become a, an interesting program called engineering and medicine. Mm-hmm. The idea there would be to integrate the coursework necessary to earn a master's in engineering with the medical school so that that engineering student can earn the master's and the MD in four years. Wow. We will be the only school to do that mm-hmm. right now. One school is attempting to do that and that's the University of Illinois. Uh, and, uh, but they haven't yet embarked on it. Uh, we're a little bit closer to doing that because our College of Engineering has really been a, a very proactive partner in this and Methodist as well. The, uh, Methodist in Houston is particularly interested in training, mm-hmm. uh, students who are interested in advancing medical technology and instrumentation. So this will afford those, uh, engineering students, for example, that are coming out of undergraduate perhaps to pursue that kind of interest in combination with an MD, which I think is another uh, interesting um, or uh, the future in, in some ways of medicine mm-hmm. uh, where we're going to see uh, more technological advances and more of our physicians having a better handle on how to work with this technology that engineers are creating that also bear the MD. Kind of right. cool. That, that really is very cool. <laughs> So we've been asking uh, several of the uh, admissions professionals from across the state, uh, what is the myth that they would like to bust in medical uh, admissions? So uh, I'd like to turn it back to you to kind of find out which myth you'd like to bust. 
Gosh, there's probably more than one. Uh, <laughs> um, I guess perhaps the, uh, the the most typical myth or the one uh, is if if you have the stellar credentials, you know, the excellent grades in MCAT that you're assuring in the medical school, mm -hmm. and that's really far from the truth. Um, medical admissions now has evolved to become more holistic in its approach to scrutinizing applications. So even a student coming from a really uh, good academic background, not that that's dismissed in any way, of course not, but if they don't have that balance of activities that we're looking for, like I mentioned earlier, you know, we really hone in on service and that's mm -hmm. important or some, or exposure in, in, in the healthcare arena, then, uh, that concerns us. Uh, the other thing that I think that's important is the students are probably under the impression that, um, uh, that, um, uh, n not knowing a lot about life, you know, or getting that perspective isn't really important, that that's something that they'll learn later. But medical schools now are really honing in on those characteristics, uh, and those values that are important in making decisions mm -hmm. about how they deal with people. And um, sometimes I think our applicant pool maybe don't quite understand uh, uh, the importance of interacting and communicating with people, especially people that are different from them. Right. Uh, in a society of, like ours that is diverse, being able to adapt is medicine. Well, the, you'll encounter that in medicine clearly. Mm -hmm. And then what the medical schools will do then is help you then, uh, in other words, we're, we're going to take that interaction to a different level. Uh, especially when you're going to have to interact with people who are suffering and afflicted, uh, are desperate, uh, and have given up hope. Mm -hmm. uh, and some are not always coming from the best of backgrounds or circumstances. And so for you to uh, put your biases in check or your prejudices is important. Uh, Absolutely. And um, so sometimes I think that that development as a person, you know, that maturity that has to occur over, you know, your, your, the course of your growth, um, is it important? It, it is. And so getting those life experiences, getting that exposure, getting out into the community is a way really to kind of challenge yourself and test yourself, uh, in terms of how you might, how your convictions might come to bear on the situation or how you might perhaps perceive a person that is really different from you. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the myth is that as long as you have the good grades, as long as you have the MCAT and a little smattering here of activities, you're going to be just fine. And that's not often the case. So schools are now digging a lot deeper mm -hmm. to get into those personal characteristics because now they're going to have to live up to those values as medical students and ultimately as physicians. So that's really where the next generation, I think, of physicians is going. At least that's how... We're, that's uh, the way we're looking at applicants. And there are so, and, and schools are doing this. Um, there's, um, for example, uh, we're looking, we're, we're seriously considering looking at an instrument to implement maybe this upcoming application cycle called CASPER, okay. which is a computerized assessment, um, of personal characteristics based on certain, you know, video presentations to kind of test your critical thinking and to see how many of those personal characteristics that we want to hone in on. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it's based on those two important uh, core competency areas, intrapersonal and intrapersonal characteristics. And so it'll be uh, like a test, yeah. very similar to an MCAT, but not as long, <laughs> um, that will generate a score that will reflect how well you, uh, an applicant may have responded to some of these things. So that's kind of a, a direction that our schools are presenting situations, mm -hmm. and now schools are actually uh, presenting those situational issues or questions or scenarios in the interview you know, to get a better sense of how they might interact or handle a difficult you know, situation. So, So that's... One myth. Yeah, that's, um, that's really uh, showing how you all are doubling down on holistic review. Exactly. And, yeah, and I think uh, uh, that's becoming increasingly more important. And, and um, now what we need to do is, is do some research to see how effective that is mm -hmm. and how uh, it uh, shapes the culture of the institution right. and how well it aligns with our values. 
and our goals as an institution. Mm -hmm. So that's the next step. Fantastic. Well, um, is there anything else that you'd like to uh, share with applicants for, for this next cycle? Yeah, I would. Just one, one more thing. Um, I know that, uh, you know, applicants put a, a lot of time and energy into the application, but the one, uh, and, and I know it's a long application and we, uh, we give students the opportunity to sh for them to tell us their story through, um, personal statements. And I, I think where sometimes, um, they may go wrong is, uh, in their approach to writing the personal statement. The one in particular in the TMDS application that requires them to expound on their motivation and the value of their experiences. And what we're often seeing is that uh, students start off with narratives or short stories about their experiences. And it, they really don't get down to, uh, they don't get to the point until the very end. So sometimes these uh, personal statements come across very disjointed and disorganized and incoherent, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And so uh, that can have an impact. So my recommendation to applicants who are looking at the application for the first time and see that prompt is to really approach it more conventional. In other words, uh, the, you know, the traditional way of handling an essay would be to develop a strong thesis that basically highlights what it is that motivates you, or drives you, or inspired you in the medicine. And whatever those reasons are that you highlight at the very onset are the ones that you're going to expound on, that you're going to draw from your experience, which in essence uh, is the body of your essay. And then lastly, you know, you know, finish off with a powerful statement that will reiterate uh, some of those very important you know, experiences or values in terms of uh, your growth. Uh, or impact that it may have had in the community, depending on what you've done. So kind of a, that approach, uh, as opposed to starting off with a poem, uh, <laughs> or with a stream of consciousness, which mm -hmm. we've seen, oh my goodness. Uh, or short stories, uh, which are in, nice to read and intriguing and some are well written, uh, but don't often answer the prompt. Mm -hmm. So that's really important is the prompt is there for a reason, and that's for us to get right to the heart of the matter and hone in on those things that we consider important rather than it being the circuitous approach, you know, to finally getting to the point of the whole, you know, of the essay. Um, so some are just filled with a lot of um, superfluous information mm -hmm. and somewhat flowery in terms of uh, language and not really getting to the point. Right. Well, uh, hopefully that's a wake up call for a lot of applicants <laughs> hopefully. to really, uh, reach out to their advisors. And, um, you know, a lot of universities offer writing centers where they can really focus right. their ideas into a, a very concise, well written, uh, personal statement. Right. Fantastic, Mr. Maldonado. Thank you so much for My joining pleasure. us. My pleasure. Make sure you subscribe to our podcast to stay up to date with us. Follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash TMDSAS and at Twitter at TMDSAS and at TMDSAS support. You can reach us at the podcast directly by emailing us at podcast at TMDSAS.com. Thank you very much for listening. We'll talk to you later.